What is up down at Sideways, all you lovely individuals? We are back. It's Liga Unlock, a little Han Solo epi again for you guys. I'm sure you never get tired of me saying the Han Solo line whenever we do these. Uh, if you've been dealing the last week with a lot of LCS and NA fans being perhaps a bit braggadocious, putting down EU and the LEC slash EMEA, well... That long-awaited dark time is over. The crashing reality of the LCS internationally has come back. The truth has returned. Everything is normal again in the universe after the first day of quarterfinal action. In Busan from the World Championship, NRG versus Weibo. The best possible draw that NRG could get, even though they got absolutely dumpstered by Weibo in the Swiss stage. This was still how you felt. They had the best opportunity to continue a miracle run into semifinals. Obviously did not end up being the case. Let's let's get this, this painful go-through over. In this first game, it actually was looking okay. It was looking good for NRG. They were carrying over uh, some of the stuff that we saw from them against G2. And Mark and I had highlighted, are we going to see this Senna Tom Kench lane? Well, NRG busts it out in the very first match of the series and i mean it was okay in the laning phase against the abelios for light uh, and the milio for crisp and early game the gold lead was slightly going in to nrg wayways trolling a little bit on the rail hopping over a couple of rift heralds went the way of nrg and you're going okay i see the angle i see the avenue we need to be winning game one if you're a fan of the lcs because we know the mental state when you go down 0-1, potentially 0-2 against an LCK or LCL, uh, LPL team, and it's not very good. Now the 3K lead for NRG, and the chase is there. They're playing front to back. You're getting, okay, Ignar goes down, but it's fine because it's more in the favor of NRG. Contracts is able to barely survive. Palafox is having some decent Orianna ultis. Okay, but the problem is Waymo's able excuse me, to sneak a, not really sneak, just take control uh, of the Baron and the vision around Baron, just netted them a Baron and then NRG's forced, they're not really forced, they decide to opt in to take in a Dragon just to go on to Soul Point and then it's all of a sudden two Nexus turrets down. It's only a 2k gold lead at this point for Weibo after getting those couple of turrets. They're barely not able to blow up light and that was the story uh, in game one, is not being able to kill Light because he doesn't have the Zaya, he doesn't have the Kaisa, but he has the Aphelios and he was just absolutely lethal. That was uh, one of the big issues, uh, not being able to kill him, even with, you know, I mean, a Renekton and an Orianna, he's never going to be walking face first into any of these shockwaves. And uh, with the Viego, there was just no way to get on this Aphelios with uh, Amelio sitting pretty buffing him up constantly. A pick I'm surprised we haven't seen more of, by the way, uh, that Amelio one. Maybe we will here as quarterfinals go on. So the early game was good. There were avenues for NRG, but... Light has the last laugh on that Aphelios. Game two, they decide that wasn't the issue because Aphelios and Milio again come through for Crisp. And this is the four-man dive, but Wei Wei is there. They blow up Light. They're still trying to get some revenge from that first game, and they get it. The problem is there's a couple of TPs coming in. First, Zhao Hu comes in. Now FBI has burned all his cooldowns. The Shy gets the Aatrox in game two. Dokla, I guess, could have TP'd, but felt like this was probably doomed, which it absolutely was. Then they're just trying to feed the kills over to the Milio, but it's a double for the Shy. A couple, four kills, I think, end up going the way of Weibo. <sighs> and then we get the fight around Baron, where this is already feeling a bit desperate. 24 minutes in, and FBI, a couple of his ultis here. As soon as the plasma gets popped onto light, he was just diving the back line, but... That back line also has some of the front line there. Despite a nice ulti from Palafox at the end, it doesn't matter. Light was never in any in any danger of dying with the Kaisa going back there. You're not fed enough to be popping them there, uh, are you, Mr. FBI? Baron here does go over to NRG. They're able to grab it, but the problem is everybody dies. No, not, you know what? Not everybody. Contracts is able to get out, so they're, you know, the buff survives, but it ends up still being a net negative 
on that uh, Baron power play for NRG. Now they're down seven, almost 8K gold. It's soul point uh, for Weibo in 10 plus seconds. And again, FBI dives into the back line. He kills the shy, but he's blown up immediately before he can actually do anything. And now he's at 20% life. Ignar's going to eventually go down. Again, Light is just sitting pretty. The peel was so damn good for Light in Game 2. Even more so uh, than Game 1 because, you know, with picks like the Vi for contracts, there was actual angles where they could take down Light. And they did kill him a couple of times, but... Not before he did all the damage in the fight or they blew too many of these cooldowns. Uh, the Kaiser for FBI was not it, as I mentioned. He was not looking uh, like some of the other highlight real Kaiser plays that we've seen throughout this event. So now down 2-0. This is, this is the same theme, the same trajectory we follow with all these LCS and sometimes, although less so, LEC teams against the LPL. Game 1 looks great. There's opportunity maybe could have would have should have won that one game two a little bit more in the favor of the other squad and if you're down 0-2 that's when the mental boom comes in for this third game contracts on the Sejuani did not have a fun time and this was this is where you still see the tilt or the believe the belief leave the eyes of NRG because they were just walking in getting one shot we're whiffing Sejuani ultis we're getting caught out just simple mechanical mistakes that we did not see throughout really the entire event for NRG but done and dusted here almost a 5k gold lead at 16 minutes the shy finally is able to pop off and uh Dominate the laning phase against Dokla's Rumble. Xiaohu's flashing. He's popping everybody. One of Xiaohu's best games of the tournament. Even when there was a nice equalizer done uh, for Dokla. There's really not much follow-up. And then it's just cleanup duty. Look at the shot. He looks unkillable. It's 24 minutes. How is anyone ever killing this Gnar? Palafox is left to just get beat up. 15 kills already for the shot or for Weibo they would end up getting four more double digit kills uh this time by the way they finally banned the Ophelios in game three and you get a Caitlyn Heimerdinger lane out of crisp and light that uh completely dominated that laning phase despite you don't want to see the most passive bot lane of all time in Ezreal Karma in an elimination game but I guess maybe NRG felt like uh there was just no answers to be had for this Weibo bot lane and by the way you see the reaction of Weibo looks like it's a regular game they're going top four now but they looked like they couldn't have even been bothered they didn't care whatsoever just another day at the office progressively more dominant wins it's 3-0 you had to listen to it a full week NRG the dream team the faithful are rewarded and it's it's the same as every year it's a 3-0 at the hands of an LPL squad and I've got a highlight. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the LCS and NRG wrapping up at Worlds. Weibo, this unbelievably easy run that they have had, not having to get a single win against an LCK and LPL squad. It's, it's, I understand that being the nature of this new Swiss format. But what's insane to me is why is the fourth seed from the LPL able to have such an easy road? It feels like this should be something that... I don't know, a JDG or uh, a Gen G, these first seeds should be having, but by the nature of starting 2 and 0, you're guaranteed to play another solid team that started 2 and 0, whereas Weibo has been, you know, beating up on these 1 and 2 teams, which of course happen to be western squads, but the fact that they've got wins against NRG, Mad Lions, NRG again matching up here and it's it's crazy how easy their schedule this is the easiest road we've ever seen a team have at top four obviously gonna have to actually prove themselves against either genji or blg in those semifinals. but it's insane that we're now at top four and this is finally where the level has seemed to peak to another level uh for weibo but i mean t1 and lng are playing in quarters so that ramped up a whole lot quicker than we were seeing out of them but Solid performance across the board from Weibo. Completely uh, outmatched NRG pretty much across the board. Xiaohu, I think, had his best, at least in game two and three, his best two games. He's probably had the entire world championship. So that bodes well if you are a fan of Weibo, them going forward, because 
the steep ramp up from Gen G B L G coming from NRG is about as drastic and uh, dramatic as it can be at this event. So we'll see if what level Weibo is actually at. But uh, you know, NRG still should be proud for the performance that they had and making it into top eight. Going deeper onto the LCS at Worlds, obviously. NRG was the last hope, not just of NA, but of the entire West. And now they are sent packing. So now we look at the lens of it all for the LCS and we say, is it an improvement? Are, are they better? Is the top eight actually impressive? Did NRG just get a little bit lucky? Uh, you start with the other two squads. Let's start. Well, you can go even back to Golden Guardians losing to BDS in the fashion that they did. That was a bit of a disappointment. 100%. Okay, then we look at Team Liquid. Well, you started off well. Had the impressive almost win against T1 that maybe you thought they could overperform. But then it was very apparent that they were gapped in some important um positions and losing to GAM is very disappointing and I think the the overall run for Team Liquid you're saying you're disappointed because they turned it on so well in the LCS uh, summer playoffs and when you're comparing to last year at Worlds guys last year it was three and 15. Every single NA team went one and five in their respective groups and most of those one wins not most of all of them were splitting games with either EU or the PCS in terms of 100 Thieves against the Flying Oysters, who they went 1-1 one and one against. So you're still going back to 2021, over two years, the last time the LCS got a win at Worlds over the LPL or the LCK. I know the Golden Guardians got a win at MSI, and Cloud9, I think, picked up a single win at MSI, but two plus years that they haven't gotten a win against Worlds, which means... The gap ain't closing. The gap maybe is widening. It's expanding uh, to unseen levels because it does feel like this world's, it feels like we hyped up that the LCS, you know what, they're actually competitive. They're getting wins against EU, but it kind of just feels like this was more of the format being a change than the LCS actually being more competitive because at the same time you had Team Liquid performing well against T1. You had Cloud9 get slaughtered by T1 in the biggest, the most one-sided matchup that we had at the entire event. So, again, less than a week after, you know, all these LCS teams have been eliminated, it, it feels like we're back to the drawing board saying, okay, so how do you improve? How do you make better? How are you actually competitive going forward at these international events? Um... I guess, I mean, you're still saying they showed up against EU, and really this is this is a year where you're at an all-time low, at least over the last five years, for Europe as a whole, because it feels like it's less of an NA level up and more of an LEC level down to be losing a lot of these head-to-head -head matchups. At least there was some saviorness out of Fnatic to be able to take down Cloud9, and... They were much more competitive against Weibo than NRG was here. So really, you're just saying G2 had a really bad day against NRG, especially when now you're seeing all these scrim uh, leaks coming from G2 that they were 7-0 against NRG in scrim. 7-0, and and then you proceed to get 2-0 bopped by them. So it, it, just an absolute disaster class from G2 on uh, the stage. But if... If you remove that one series, I think you're still saying EU outperformed NA at this event. Sure, they lost a couple of best of ones, but it feels like the gap is bigger than ever when now you have these consistent fourth seeded teams like D Plus and Weibo. They're the ones sweeping away EU and NA squads, not even able to pick up a game in these best of series and are clearly a cut above. And these are the fourth best teams going up against the first seed of the LCS, and you've got no chance that, at least historically, you felt like there was an angle maybe where you could talk about uh, the LCS picking up wins against the fourth seed from some of these other major regions, but that is just not the case that we are living in. I will say the positives to take away from this world are, of course, NRG performing at a high level and NRG having these domestic players that have been stuck in academy, Dokla, contracts 
came all the way back through that academy system. And Palafox is the guy who's been around in that academy scene. They've been given these opportunities, and here they are at least making top eight and performing to better levels, I guess, than we've seen before uh, the last couple of years from the LCS. I mean, 3-15 and 15 is hard to be worse than, but, you know, we stepped over that ground-level hurdle, um, at least of expectations. But hopefully, this new-look LCS in 2024 with budget cuts across the board for all these teams, we're going to see these young uh, domestic players getting more opportunity more so than spending money on washed up free agents from other regions. Although PL Sigma was the best performing Team Liquid player and is by no means washed up. And we love you, PL Sigma. I hope you stick around at the LCS, but I also hope you don't for your own mental health and sanity. But that fine balance of domestic players and imports coming over, we hope that we are entering a new era in the LCS where the young guns are given an opportunity, not just in the LCS on the big stage, but to prove themselves internationally against some of the world's best. Part of this new look 2024 LCS, we're already. Cloud9 hasn't even, I guess it's been about a week since they've been eliminated. We were saying there's probably going to be some big roster changes coming from one of the Titans in the LCS and... Quickly already, Sven announcing not only that he's going to be entering free agency for 2024, but also he's swapping back to AD Carry. He's had enough of this support is too easy. And this obviously speaks to what I think I and a lot of people have speculated that we're going to have some sweeping changes to this Cloud9 roster if Sven is out that means it's a mystery what Berserker's going to be doing. I know he's said at times he only wants to play if Zvan is his support, to which you might say, buddy, you should see how good some other supports are out there that you could get. You're going to be looking even better in that bot lane. No offense to Zvan, but you never felt like he was truly a top-tier support in the LCS even, especially when this meta fully transitioned uh, to a lot more of these engaged champions and the Lulu and Yumi's were left on the back burner so obviously a priority to bring berserker back but if not i wouldn't be shocked if blabber is the only returning member on this cloud nine roster heading into 2024 obviously that's all a question mark and remains to be seen i know he's best buddies with fudge but it feels like this core has reached its peak and its peak was pretty damn high winning multiple lcs titles but never able to get it together on the international stage and with more teams up and coming uh now heading into the next year I feel like it's a perfect time for a bit of a reset for this cloud nine roster who time and time again we kind of throw up question mark pings for what they're doing in the offseason, but more often than not, it ends up being a pretty damn good sweeping success, and there is no team better in the LCS than finding this young talent, scouting it early, and allowing it to develop and flourish. I hope that is potentially an angle that they take going forward. When you look at Sven, I feel like in years past, you might say, wow, where's this dude going to find a spot? in the LCS as an AD carry. That's kind of one of the reasons he swapped to support is he felt like the opportunity was the best on Cloud9 to just bring in another AD carry and for him to stay on the squad. But I got to say, prospects are probably actually looking pretty good heading into 2024 for him. When you look at some of the potential available teams for him, things that jump out immediately, Prince is no longer on FlyQuest, maybe a reunion with Vulcan? Over on there, Spica uh, is obviously a guy that he sort of has history with. With I think there was some crossover between him on uh, TSM. 2019 was when Spica got thrown under the bus. So not a great history with him uh, and Spica, but at least they have history there. Papa Smithy's a guy I'm sure he gets along with. So that's an angle. Should be a good team uh, for FlyQuest, assuming Impact is also staying. We just know that Prince and Bikla are out on that squad. And... That's not it. I mean, the Shopify Rebellion taking over TSM spot. We know they're signing Insanity returning. I would hope that they're bringing Chime back. Wild Turtle could stay, but this is probably an angle for Sven that could be a playoff team with some upside uh, because 
I think Hanser was kind of the one weak point for this squad. Maybe Boogie's returning, but if you go Boogie, Insanity, Zvan, and Chime, that's a team that could have the potential for top four, depending on what uh, what top laner ends up being on this roster heading into the year. So that's the decent one. And then you could throw in others. Team Liquid, you just slot out Jan, who, let's be honest, was the biggest liability uh, for Team Liquid. Another year of development for APA. If you just swap out Jan uh, for Sven, I feel pretty good about Team Liquid potentially being a title threat heading into the LCS. And you go one further, Golden Guardians, same thing. If you swap out Stixa, still feel like Sven would be an improvement, especially the level that we got out of Stixa in the summer split. And then you look at that exact same Golden Guardians core uh, and just throws Van alongside who he I'm feeling pretty good so there's one two three four potential spots that you could slot Sven into where I think at least there's no way he's going to a team where he doesn't feel like he can be contending for an LCS title and contending for a spot at Worlds. I think all four of those I just mentioned are a possibility that he could be uh, vying there especially if Cloud9 is being blown up uh, and NRG, I mean, even if they come back with the same roster, I think people are going to disrespect and not be talking about them as maybe the favorites to win the split, depending on how these off seasons go. And even on NRG, I feel like Zven 80 carry could be an upgrade over FBI. I know he had some highlight moments, but, you know, at the end of Worlds, it wasn't a great performance out of him. And I don't think anyone has any doubt that Zven... There's nobody harder working than him in the LCS. I'm not worried about if he does decide to go roll swap back to AD carry, the position he played for six years at a professional setting. I have much more faith in him going back to that than I even did him rolling into that support role. So fully expect to see Sven in the LCS still in 2024, likely on a different team, but still contending to add to his incredible legacy as a western player when it comes to titles but that is it today for the gunlock my name is eric as always thank you you beautiful people for watching and we will catch you on that flippity flip